Well, one possibility is that we can try changing the frequency of the transmitter. Keeping the transmitter 650 meters high, if we change the frequency of the source, F naught, the transmitter will have a different electrical wavelength, and it should have a slightly different radiation pattern. I reran the model with a source frequency of 15 kilohertz instead of 10 kilohertz. Here's a comparison of the results plotted using the same scale. We can see that we have a slightly different radiation pattern from the antenna and that the waves are reflecting at different positions and maybe even at different angles off the ionosphere. Here is a plot of the EZ max fields along the surface of the Earth at 10 kilohertz and 15 kilohertz. In this plot, we can see that while there is a null at about 430 grid cells at 10 kilohertz, at 15 kilohertz, there is a null around 330 cells, but not at 430 grid cells. In other words, it looks like we can deal with nulls if we periodically change the operating frequency of the transmitter. If we periodically change the operating frequency of the transmitter, there's a good chance that the signal will at least be receivable at one of the frequencies at any distance from the transmitter until the signal is too weak to detect so when we're too far away from the transmitter. For example, if the receiver is in the location of a null at one frequency, it isn't likely to be in a null at other frequencies at the same time. By the way, another benefit of switching frequencies is that we could then unambiguously identify which transmitter is sending it assuming we know what frequency each transmitter is operating at at any given moment in time. Now so far we've assumed daytime ionospheric conditions, but while there is day in some parts of the world, we know that there will always be areas that have nighttime ionospheric conditions. In this diagram we can see that the bottom side of the ni nighttime ionosphere is at a higher altitude closer to 90 kilometers than the bottom side of the ionosphere at daytime, where it's closer to 70. This might be hard to see, but it's, it's up, raised up a little bit. That is, the ionosphere is lower during the day, and the reason is that sunlight ionizes the ionosphere, which creates more free electrons, and increases the electron density at lower altitudes in the ionosphere. Let's see what effect night might have on our propagating VLF signal at 10 kilohertz relative to what we saw for daytime conditions. To change between day and night, all we need to do is change the reflection height and the sharpness of the electron density profile of the ionosphere. For day, we had the reflection altitude was 75 kilometers and the sharpness was 0.5 and the units there is 1 over kilometer. And then the best match for night, is the reflection height, we, get, we should use 85 kilometers and for the sharpness we should use 0.7, 1 over kilometers. But since the reflection altitude is higher, at an altitude of 85 kilometers, we have a problem because right now the top of our grid ends at an altitude of 78 kilometers. So that would be where k max is. If this is k equals 1, that's where the ground is. So this means we need to raise up the top of our model because right now we're only modeling up to 78 kilometers. So let's model up to maybe 88 kilometers or so. Try running your model for day and then nighttime conditions. We're going to be at 10 kilohertz and uh, set k max so that your grid goes up to 88 kilometers when you're modeling night or you can keep it at that height for day as well. It's not going to affect your daytime results. Plot on the same graph the EZ max along the surface of the Earth, so this will be versus I, for both conditions so we can directly compare the results in one dimension across the ground.